Welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. So far we covered three big chapters. The first one was on foundational truths and definitions. The second one was on God's will about healing. And the third one was answering objections to healing. The most common objections that Christians bring from the Bible were to against healing. And today we're continuing with the fourth big chapter, fourth big chapter entitled False Obstacles to Healing. Why do I call them false? Because they are not actually obstacles to our healing and to seeing results, but they can behave as obstacles when we allow them in our minds and we believe them because indirectly they undermine and forfeit our faith for healing. And that's why they behave like obstacles against our healing, but they are false. They are not real obstacles. And we will, of course, talk about real obstacles also, about valid obstacles later on. But today we're beginning to talk about these so-called obstacles, which are not really obstacles. And I'd like to start with an example. You know, one, one day I was in a grocery store with my son, Justin, and I was standing in line buying some groceries. And while I was staying in line, I've noticed some soccer ball, some fancy soccer ball, uh, 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 near the door of the grocery store. And there was a big sign with big letters saying that you can buy a ball for your son for only one euro. And looking at the quality of the balls, I was thinking to myself, that would be a really nice gift for my son. He really likes soccer balls. He likes balls in general to play with balls. So I was thinking, I'll buy one for him. One euro, what is one euro? But then while I was standing in line, I've noticed also somewhere down with very small letters that that offer was available only for purchases of over 100 euro. I was like, what? Come on. I mean, this cancels all the joy that I had to buy that ball. I mean, no matter how big letters you use to tell me that that ball is for one euro, the moment I see that disclaimer, I don't want your ball anymore because you are asking first for something of me before I can have that ball for one euro. And in a similar way, we think about God so many times that God's promises come with disclaimers and they don't. They never come with disclaimers. God is a very pragmatic God. He's a God of joy. He never promises something and then cancels it with a disclaimer, especially on healing. God is not like that. And that's what we're trying to dismantle here, to dismantle all these small so-called disclaimers that try to kill your faith, try to, uh, try to uh, undermine your faith for healing and your joy. All disclaimers in general or for any discounts or offers, they kind of cancel your joy because they come with something that you have to do first. But God is not like that. When he promises something, it's for now, it's for you in full. He doesn't have this habit of adding disclaimers. But people allow these disclaimers in their minds. And that's why we're talking about these things. They are subtle. Sometimes you're not even aware of them. So the first uh, false obstacle that we will tackle today is the hidden will of God. You know, God is not our problem. He's never our problem. He is our help. If you face any resistance, any problem when you're praying for someone to be healed or for yourself to be healed, you have to know that the problem is never with God. He is on our side. He is on your side. The problem is with the devil. He is the one putting putting up resistance towards you. Sickness comes from the devil. So God is your help. Whenever you don't see results immediately or you don't see a person being healed, don't, be, don't start asking God, why God? Why did you allow this sickness? Why are you allowing this person to stay sick? Because he is not the one stopping your healing from coming to that person. He is never holding back any healing from anyone. The devil is the one putting up resistance. 
And God is not holding that healing back until we get all things right like a formula. God is not like that. God is a good God, is a pragmatic God, is a practical God if you want. And if you have your Bibles ready, I would like to begin reading a first passage from Isaiah 55, verses 6 to 9. It's a very famous uh, passage and it's used many times in a wrong way. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you are welcome to use any English translations that you have available. Let's read it together. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This passage is so many times interpreted as if God has a hidden will, a mysterious will, whenever we don't see healing happening, we allow this thought to come in our mind that God has a will, a hidden will that we cannot know about and that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And this obstacle, this obstacle when we believe it, kills our faith. But let's see if that's really true indeed. First, we, have to, we, we need to notice that God's higher thoughts and ways in this passage are not some mysterious will that we cannot understand as many Christians imply. And according to the context of this passage, those thoughts and ways are compassion and abundant pardon instead of punishment that when we deserve it, that we deserve it. That is the context of this verse. When God says in verse 8 that my thoughts are not your thoughts, it's a continuation from the previous verse where it says, and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts. In other words, you guys want me to punish the wicked man. You, you want justice. You want punishment that he deserves. But I am a God of pardon. I am a God of compassion, of love. I want to pardon. If those people come and return to me, I will pardon them. I will show compassion and love to them because my thoughts and my ways are not like your ways. That's the context of this passage. It's not some mysterious will on healing that we cannot understand. Second, even if this verse would refer to a difference of thoughts and ways between us and God in different areas of our lives, that verse, this verse applied to the Old Testament people, to the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, we know that we have the Holy Spirit who, who teaches us all things. And we can see that in John 14 verse 26, the Holy Spirit will teach us all things then the Holy Spirit reveals to us what God has freely given us. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12 tells us this. And he also takes the deep things of God and discloses them to us. And we see that in John 16 verse 14. So there is no hidden will of God in regards to healing that we cannot know in the new covenant. The Holy Spirit reveals to us everything we need to know, especially on things like healing, which has been freely given to us together with the Son of God on the cross. Let's read 1 Corinthians 2.16. It says this, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. That's what the Bible says. We think like Christ. We have access to all the treasure, treasures and of knowledge and wisdom, the Bible says. When we come in Christ and Christ comes into us, we receive access to his mind, to his thinking, to the things that he's thinking by the Holy Spirit. So we know the will of God through Christ. There's no hidden will. We know the will of God, things that God has given us. There's no hidden will, especially about healing, which is clearly revealed in Scripture. Amen? 
So don't allow this uh, verse, this passage from Isaiah 55, that his ways are not your ways. And if healing doesn't happen, then God must have some mysterious will. Wrong, false. That's why I call it a false obstacle. Because the devil uses this passage with a wrong interpretation so many times to block our faith and to block uh, us seeing results when we pray for healing for ourselves and not only for healing for other things too so i hope these this uh, whatever what what i said until now clarifies that this is a false obstacle the hidden will of god the second obstacle i want to discuss today is that obstacle where we allow in our mind to think that god is teaching us something through a sickness or a disease. And that's so prevalent, so common among Christians that we have to endure that God is trying to teach us something. I have a question for that person who says that God is teaching them something through sickness. What exactly does God want to teach you through, the, through a sickness or disease? And most Christians will answer they don't know. But if you don't know, what God is trying to teach you, that means God is a bad teacher because he would be interested for you to know whatever he is trying to teach you. If you don't know what he's trying to teach you, then you make him a bad teacher. But if he's trying to teach you, he would told, he will tell you what he's trying to teach you. And then second, to say that God uses sickness or disease to teach you something is to say that the sickness is the Holy Spirit or that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of infirmity. Why? Because the Bible says in John 14, 26, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach us all things. He teaches us all things. The Holy Spirit teaches us everything we need to know. And not sickness or disease. God doesn't need the tools of the devil or these helpers to teach us something because he has sent us the helper, the Holy Spirit, who is supposed to teach us all things. He doesn't teach us through sickness and disease. Let's read John 14 verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. He is the helper. He is the teacher. Not sickness and disease. And third, remaining sick and living in sin are both a choice. And remember in previous session, I told you that uh, uh, sin and sickness, they are on the same place. Forgiveness of sin and healing of sickness, they are both bought at the cross by Jesus' sacrifice. But if God used a sickness to teach me something, then he would also want me sometimes to live in sin, to learn something, to teach me something. Isn't that right? But we know that God doesn't want us to sin. We don't learn through sin. In a similar way, you don't learn. God is not trying to teach you something through sickness. There's no mention of this idea anywhere in the New Testament. God is always teaching us through his Holy Spirit. That's his helper to us. Amen. I hope I killed this, uh, this obstacle, this so-called obstacle as well. And we will never allow it in our mind that God is teaching us something when we have some sickness or someone is facing some sickness. Now let's move on to the third objection that's, that is entitled, God is disciplining me. We allow this idea that whenever we go through sickness, that God might be disciplining us. Because we did something wrong, where we sinned, where we have some immorality in our life. And God is disciplining us as sons. Have you heard of this idea? I think it's pretty common in the body of Christ. And many Christians believe that God disciplines his children with sickness either for their sinful actions or behavior or to make them humble. Have you heard this? But this is a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie. God is not disciplining his children because of their sinful habits or to make them hum humble. James 
1 verse 17 says that says this that god let's read it together that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights lights sickness or disease doesn't qualify as a good gift not to mention as a perfect one God is not like that. And sickness, as I said, is from the devil. God doesn't need the devil's tools to fix any good thing for his children. Amen? Why would he have to use the instrument of Satan to perform a good deed in your life? He would lower himself if he, if he had done that. If God put sickness on you to humble you and then you ran to your doctor or took drugs to take away what God put on you to make you humble, wouldn't that be hypocrisy on your part? Why are we running to doctors? Why are we trying to get well if we think that God is disciplining us? The truth is God never inflicts sickness on any of his children to make them humble. That's the truth. He will not do that to make you humble. Then a good father, you know, a good father would never like to see his children suffer. Now I am a father too. I never want my son to suffer. Actually, even when I have to discipline him, it hurts me. I'd never want him to suffer. Rather, I work hard to ensure that he doesn't. And no earthly parent could love or care for his children better than our God. No parent could be more willing to do good things for their family than he does, than our God. God is the best daddy there is. And we as earthly fathers, we are created after, according to his image and likeness. He is the best father that we could ever have. And he created us in his image. But even if we are in his, in his image, we can never be better than him. And if a normal earthly father wants the best for his kids, much more, much more than our father, our heavenly father wants good things for his children. And we need to recognize and take full advantage of the fatherhood of God, knowing that his will is to bless us and not to curse us. Amen. He's a God of blessing. He's a God of love. He doesn't want to curse us or um, give us sickness. Let's read 3 John verse 2, chapter 1 verse 2, it's only one chapter, where it says this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. I want to read it again. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. We can see here that John, by the Spirit, spoke the heart of God, that this is God's desire for you. He wants you to prosper in all things and be in good health and be a success. That's what he wants for you. He's more willing to give you healing than you are ready to receive. That's God's heart. And this is the, the number one thing that the devil tries to attack in Christians, to change their perspective and their image of a good God into a bad God, into a God who is too holy for us, who is separated from us, a God for whom we need to do certain things, to come up, to, do, to uh, adhere to certain standards. And that's the number one thing that the devil hits on our perspective of a good father. God is a good father. He's all for you. He's all for us. His heart, his desire is for us. Matthew 7, 11 says this. If you then, being evil, know how to give good things, good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus himself shows how good our heavenly father is so if earthly fathers do not teach or discipline their children with sickness disease or poverty then all the more our heavenly father will never teach us by punishing us with bad things amen he is not like that he is a good father 
But the main biblical basis for this false obstacle, this false assumption that God disciplines us through sickness to humble us is from Hebrews chapter 12, where the Bible talks about God disciplining his children. And the whole context uh, is Hebrews 11 verse 32 to in Hebrews 12 verse 13. It's a bigger text, but we need to read to understand the context of that so-called discipline. And it would be even better if we could read the whole book of Hebrews at once, because then you will understand much more. But let's read this smaller context. Let's read it together. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the age of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin, and you have forgotten the ex exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegit illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we pay them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened, uh, chastened us as sin best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable, peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. The whole context of this passage is from Hebrews 11.32 to 12.13. Uh, in this passage, I want us to see first that the text doesn't say anywhere that the discipline of God is through sickness or poverty. Have you noticed that? There's no mention of sickness or poverty as, as being the discipline of God to his children. All these are assumptions. They are false assumptions. And it, you can see now how easily we read into text things that we heard from other people, from people that we trusted maybe, from other uh, dear people to us. And we put them into the text, although they are not there. 
We assume that God disciplines us through sickness and poverty, and that's wrong. It's false. And then nowhere in the text it says that the purpose of discipline is to humble us. This is a second assumption which is false. There's no mention of God disciplining us to humble us. Amen? Second, if we look carefully at the whole context, we can easily notice that the theme of, of the whole thing is enduring persecutions because of the gospel. That's what this passage talks about, mainly about persecutions and not discipline because of sin or immorality. And we see that in verse 2 of chapter 12, where it tells us to look unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What was the cross? Was it sickness or disease? Was it to humble him? No, it was persecution. It was suffering for the sake of God, for God's sake and for our sins. And the next word, verse tells us again to consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. So he was dying for a good cause. He was persecuted. He was not in sickness or poverty. Immediately after that, the passage talks about our discipline. After mentioning Jesus, the, the passage talks about our discipline. So the parallel and the comparison is Jesus' suffering with our discipline. Can you see the parallel? It, the analogy? Jesus' suffering and our discipline. Jesus didn't suffer with sickness and poverty. didn't suffer because he was immoral or he was in sin. He never sinned. So he was suffering unjustly. He was persecuted. The same way is our discipline because this is the analogy. Third, in all this context, there are three categories of people. Categories of people. The first category is other sons. And we see that in chapter 11, verses 32 to 39 that we just read. All these other sons are the cloud of witnesses from uh, chapter 12, verse 1, who were persecuted for their faith and they endured and stood firm until the end. Actually, verse 1 from chapter 12 sets the tone for the whole passage. It's, a, it's the tone, the theme is persecution and enduring in faith, for the faith. The second category is Jesus Christ, the Son, who endured the cross. So we see other sons, we see Jesus, the son, and then we see us, his sons. And we are supposed to do the same thing. That's the parallel. They endured for the faith. Then the word sinners from verse 3 of chapter 12, who came against Jesus, weren't sinners in general, like uh, or necessarily immoral people. Those who crucified Jesus, who were they? They were Pharisees, they were priests, they were legalists, they were religious leaders and self-righteous people. Those were the sinners that crucified Jesus mainly. They were not immoral people necessarily, but they were people of self-righteousness and legalists and Pharisees. Then in verse 1 of chapter 12, when it talks about laying aside every weight, it refers to the weight of law of works, of obedience to the law. That was a weight for the people of Israel. And why do I think that it talks about the weight of the law? Because all verses before this one, where it says uh, to put aside every weight, focuses on faith and persecutions and how to overcome persecutions through faith, not through works. And not only that, but the whole book of Hebrew, if you will read it, you will see that the theme is the, the book of Hebrew talks about the superiority of faith compared to uh, Israel's fathers, uh, compared to the law of Moses and Moses himself, compared to angels, that faith is superior to all those. That's the whole theme of the book of Hebrews. And, uh, when, and here, when the author says, put aside every weight, it talks about uh, the weight of the law. And then we see the word sin in the same context. It refers to our own self-righteousness and unbelief because that's the root of all immoral sins, all the other sins. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. 
So as long as you have the weight of the law, it, it, it will empower sin. So that's why the, I believe here it says about, it talks about the weight of the law and the sin that comes with the law and mainly the sin of self-righteousness and unbelief that clings to us and entangles us together, all the, together with all the other sins. And then verse 4 of chapter 12 is not talking about immoral sin or any individual specific sin like your sin and my sin. But it talks about the sin of other people, the general idea of sin which is against the gospel, the whole atmosphere of darkness around us, the atmosphere of sin around you and me. It talks about the sin of the legalists, of their unbelief. We always, all, almost always give in and compromise when we face opposition from sin. When we have to be persecuted because of our belief, of our conviction, because of the gospel, gospel, sometimes we give in, we, we get into unbelief. So when, when the Bible says that we have not resisted sin and we have not fought sin uh, uh, until bloodshed, it talks about sin in general, like the, the force of sin, the, 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 all the sin around us. Then what is the discipline that this passage is talking about? What do you think it's the discipline of God that this passage talks about? Let's see. It's a twofold discipline. For the first one is persecution for the gospel. That's what we've seen so far, that it talks mainly about persecution. And that's a way God is disciplining us. And the second, we will see, is training in righteousness of faith through the word. God never brings hardships and persecution on his children, neither he gives them. Even though they are a discipline, it's not God bringing them on his children. He's not the one giving persecution to his children. God doesn't like it when you are smashed and broken. You have to understand that. It's not God bringing persecution, but the devil through other people. Amen. He, God didn't enjoy seeing Jesus crucified on the cross. He didn't find joy in that. He suffered when he saw Jesus crucified, his only son. These persecutions don't come because of wrongdoing or immorality. In fact, these persecutions come because we're doing something right. You will not be persecuted when you are immoral or in sin. You will be persecuted when you're doing something right. All these people, the cloud of witnesses, Jesus, they did something right. They stood for the faith, for the gospel. And because of that, they were persecuted. So whenever you're disciplined, you're disciplined because you're doing something right. Amen. The persecutions both confirm to us that we are true sons of God and they train us in how to endure them. They prove that you are the son of God. God is boasting with us because we learn to be tough, to be strong in faith. You know, when you go to military, you go through all kinds of exercises and trainings that push your limits, that push your body. And it's painful. It's not easy. It's painful. But what's the purpose of those trainings, of those hardships? To make you stronger, to be able to endure, to be able to stand in faith and to overcome. That's, that's the role of persecutions. That, uh, that's the discipline. If you compare military, the discipline of the military, the discipline is not actually uh, uh, supposed to crush or, or break you completely. The discipline and the exercises, their purpose is to make you stronger, not to break you. Amen? And that's what God is, is expecting that's what God is standing on the sides and expecting from us to, to come out stronger from any persecution and make him proud that we are his sons, that we are true sons of God. We are not just some humans that are trampled upon, broken, smashed, and trampled upon dark, darkness. He expects us to stand against darkness and put shame to darkness. Amen. I'm so excited about this. The word chasten from verse 6 of chapter 12 comes from the Greek paideo, which means to train, instruct, teach, cause one to learn. That's the definition of the word chasten in verse 6. And the same word is used in the context of education in Acts chapter 7 verse 22, where it talks about Moses being educated in Egypt. That's the same word, paideo. Then in Acts 22, verse 3, Paul was educated by Gamaliel. Gamaliel. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, 
it talks about gentle correction of those in opposition. It is the same word, paideo. And then Titus chapter 2, verse 12, when it talks about instruction to deny ungodliness. So the word chasten is not what we think it is. It is education. It's training, instruction. That's the meaning of it. Then the second word, scourge, from the same verse 6, comes from Greek mastigo, which means punishment or accusation. But the same word is used in Matthew 10, 17, Matthew 20, verse 19, and Matthew 23, verse 34, all in the context of persecution. That's the same word, mastigo. And then in Mark 10, verse 34, Luke 18, 33, John 19, verse 1, again in the context of Jesus' persecution and suffering, scourge, mastigo, it's persecution. So the first word chasten is training, instruction, education. The second word scourge is persecution. And I was mentioning the two ways that God is so called, so is disciplining us, disciplining his children. Persecution and education, training through his word. And then verses 12 and 13 in chapter 12 show us that this whole passage is actually an encouragement from God. It do not give up and push through when we go through trials and perse persecutions. God encourages us. I can see God staying on the sidelines with a cloud of witnesses, cheering up, cheering up for us and expecting us to push through. Come on, push through. Come the other side. Do not give up. Do not dis discourage. Do not be discouraged. Actually, the text says, do not be discouraged and weary. Don't get weary, don't get tired, but push through and fight for the faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Push through all those persecutions, through all that training, through all that discipline, so that you become stronger and put to shame the kingdom of darkness. Amen? The second type of discipline that I was talking about, besides persecution, was training in righteousness of faith through the word. Verses 9 and 10 in chapter 12 make a comparison between fathers of our flesh, our earthly fathers, and father of spirits, who is our heavenly father. He is the father of spirits. Now the fathers of our flesh discipline us in our flesh, as some of us know. But the father of spirits disciplines us in our spirits. How? Through his word. That's his discipline, his education. His training through His Holy Spirit. He trains our spirits through His Word. He opens our mind to understand who we are, who we are in Christ, what, what, what we're supposed to do, what is our inheritance. That's how He trains us in righteousness. And this means that as you read the Bible or as you listen to God's Word being preached, a church or a podcast or on internet, you are being trained and being taught by the Lord. That's the second way that God trains us, disciplines us, disciplines us. So there's no, there's, there's no idea, there's not a mention in this passage of God breaking us, smashing us with sickness and poverty because of our immoralities and sins. This is not the idea of this passage. So I hope with all these words that I, I said that it will help you understand more and help you understand and kill that obstacle. Put it aside. Destroy it in your mind. Because God, because God is not like that. God doesn't want to smash you. Doesn't want to break you. He wants to encourage you, to propel you, to help you. And He has given us everything we need to succeed. His Holy Spirit, His Word has given us eternal life. He has given us His Son. He has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Everything pertaining to life and godliness. Amen. Now let's move on to the fourth obstacle, so-called false obstacle, where we know, we think that God's will is to heal us, but I gave authority to the devil. I opened the door to him. And that's why the devil, God or the devil sent the sickness and I cannot do anything about it because I did it to myself. I gave him authority. I gave him leeway and open door to do this to me. But that is wrong. That's a false obstacle that tries to kill our faith. Why? Because Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth and he has given that authority to you and me. 
The devil has no authority. If Jesus has all the authority, the devil has none. Amen? And we are wrong to think that if the devil attacked us, then he must have had authority to do so. He doesn't have authority. He has ability. He has some power that he abuses. But he doesn't have authority whatsoever over Christians to do anything. Amen? Let me give an example. Let's say I give my car keys to my friend to drive it. And then my friend gives the keys to another friend to drive the car. And that guy disappears. What do I do now? I call the police. And when they find the guy, maybe the guy will say, yeah, but I, I got permission from my friend to drive this car. And the police would ask, which friend? Did Edward, did the owner of the car give you permission to drive his car? No, I, I didn't give him permission. My friend maybe gave him permission, but he was not supposed to give permission because he didn't own the car. And the same principle applies to us in Christ. We are owned by Christ. The moment we come in the family of God, we are owned by Christ. He is our owner. He is the one giving permission. He is the one having all authority. So even if we think we gave permission to the devil to do something, we can always expel him because Jesus Christ is our authority. He's our owner. And the devil doesn't have any authority. Even if we gave it to him, we can take it back. Amen. At any moment. Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20 says this. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And yo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has all authority and power in heaven and earth. And through him we have the same authority, especially on earth. But in heaven and on earth, in the heavenly places and on earth, we have the authority of Jesus Christ. But if, even if we've given the devil opportunities to come in, as I said before, we can expel him out anytime. And that's good news. We are wrong to think that if the devil has authority or if he was given authority by us, we cannot do anything about it anymore. That's false. That is wrong and it keeps people in bondage. It keeps Christians in bondage. We can do something about it at any moment. When you find out the truth, the truth will make you free because you find out that you can do something about it. And you cannot give permission to the devil to do something and then not being able to recover it back or to reverse it. You always have the authority to cast him out no matter what. Let's see Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God will allow on you whatever you allow on you. You are responsible, not God. He has given us the keys of the kingdom and the authority to bind or loose. He has given it to us. What we allow will be allowed by God too. What we refuse and reject, God will reject too in heaven. What we allow on earth, it will be allowed in heaven. What we reject on earth, it will be uh, rejected in heaven or loose. There is no place where you've allowed something and then you can do anything about it to change. You can. And I hope this it enters your heart and penetrates your heart that you can or you can always do something and cast the devil out no matter what you experience no matter what you think you did no matter if you thought that you've given him authority or you opened the door or we will as we will see third one that i did it to myself let's read two more passages where i want to touch about a little bit on unforgiveness because this is also a very prevalent and common obstacle matthew chapter 18 verses 21 to 35 that's the first passage and then the second one is matthew 6 14 to 15 that but let's read first the first passage uh, now 18 matthew 18 21 to 35 then peter came to him and said lord how often shall my brother sin against me and i forgive him up to seven times Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. That's the, uh, the portion that I want to deal with and talk about. And then the second passage is shorter, Matthew 6 verses 14 to 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So what about unforgiveness? If we as Christians fail to forgive others as we have been forgiven, will we get our original sin and death reinstated? Or will God put a sickness on us because of that? Or will the devil have authority to put sickness on us because of that? These are the questions that I'm, I'll be trying to answer here about unforgiveness. And if indeed unforgiveness can be a blockage or an obstacle against our faith, in the way of our faith for healing. These, passage, these two passages seem to tell us that God's forgiveness is conditional upon our forgiving others. Isn't that right? And to suggest that God will reinstate our sins even after we have been forgiven. If we do not forgive our brother and so making salvation or even healing, salvation and healing, conditional upon our forgiving unto others. That's what these two passages seem to suggest, that we can forfeit our salvation and healing if, even after we have been forgiven, if we don't forgive others. And that's the usual interpretation that Christians assign to this text. Let's see if that's true indeed. First, let's notice that the king in this parable called that servant, named that servant wicked. And that's a term that is never used in the New Testament for the body of Christ or for believers in Christ's atonement. Wicked. The Bible never calls Christians wicked. Moreover, Jesus was not saying anything about those unforgiving people being thrown into hell. That's a false assumption that we assign to this text, that we will be thrown into hell if we don't forgive. But Jesus doesn't say anything about hell here. Amen? Second, this parable is not saying that once, once people are saved and their sins are forgiven through the atonement of Jesus Christ, that their salvation can be revoked. The text doesn't say that, that salvation can be revoked or forfeited. That would go against so many scriptures that show that we are securing Christ from the moment of salvation onward. And that would even contradict the words of Jesus himself in many places in scripture. So the text doesn't say anything about salvation being forfeited if we don't forgive. Third, in the two passages above, above, there's no mention of God putting a sickness on us because of unforgiveness at all. There's nowhere in the text that God will put sickness on us because of unforgiveness. That's another assumption that we read into the text. 
But the text doesn't say anything like that. Both passages don't mention anything about sickness as being a punishment for unforgiveness. Fourth, it is important for us to notice that the context of, context of Matthew 18, 21 to 35 is the Jewish law. We also need to realize that Jesus was making the transition from the law of Moses into grace, into the gospel. He had not died yet at the cross when he was saying that parable. So most of the things that he said and did were in the context of the old co covenant, while a few were about the future new covenant. So he made the transition. He spoke of the old and of the new. He was in the middle. And the conditioned nature of his saying in this parable sounds very much like the law of Moses, like the Deuteronomy 28. If you obey this and this, if you do this and this, then I will bless you. If you don't do this, I will curse you. If, then, else, curse. And the, the way this parable is constructed is, sounds very similar. The conditioned nature sounds very similar to the law of Moses. That's another clue. So Jesus, through his ministry on earth, it, you will notice that he took the law of Moses and raised it to the strictest of standards. By showing the extremes of the law, the, the most strictest standards, Jesus was preparing the, his people for what is coming. And what is coming, what was coming, was the new covenant of the grace of God. How were, was he preparing the people for the new covenant? By showing to them how impossible it is to please God on their own efforts. How impossible it is for them to fulfill the law. By bringing the law from the letter to the spirit, bringing the spirit of the law out. Not just the letter, not just the exterior, but the interior, the inside. And Jesus focused, focused a lot on the interior, on the inside, so that people would realize, that's the context of this parable, the people would realize that their righteousness, their self-righteousness is nothing before God. And we see later on in the New Testament that Jesus used the Apostle Paul to teach the Gentiles about the grace of God, the, about the new covenant. And also the Sermon on the, mountain, uh, on the Mount by Jesus in Matthew 5, it was an amplification, an amplifier of the law of Moses. Because he always said, you know that the law says this, but I say to you, if you just look at a woman with lust in your heart, you sinned, you committed adultery. So Jesus amplified the law of Moses. He made it greater, bigger, so that people would see how small they are, how impossible it is for them to please God and to fulfill the law. And as a matter of fact, if you look carefully at the parable, the way the servant asked the king for mercy and the request to give him more time to be patient, to pay back the debt, he said, give me more time to pay you and I'll pay you all. That shows that this individual did not grasp the reality of the situation, that he could not pay all. And that was his first mistake. That's the first sign of self-righteousness that Jesus was targeting in this parable, that this parable was in the context of the law of Moses. And this servant thought he could pay back the debt of sin through self-effort. But we cannot ever pay for our sins ourselves. Only Christ accomplished that for us on the cross. And having been forgiven by the king, the servant then thought arrogantly that he was better than others who were sinning and had a sin debt, as if he didn't have sins anymore. That's the way he behaved. He was proud. And that was, that was his second mistake, that he was better than others. After he, the king forgave him, oh, I'm better. I did something. So now I'm better than you. You have to pay. And he treated others harshly based on their death as sinners. He was too full of pride, just like Satan was. So we see two mistakes here. To think that you can pay all. And second, after you've been forgiven, to think that you are something, that you did it for your own efforts. And that's what Jesus was targeting here when he talked about the conditioned nature of forgiveness. But believers in Christ are a different matter. They are no longer under the law of Moses. Neither salvation or healing is under the condition of obedience to the law. And that's an important thing. Your salvation, your healing does not depend on your obedience to the law. Does not depend on your good works after salvation. 
If you do good works or bad works, they are not a condition for your salvation and healing. The only condition is faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus obeyed the law for us. Jesus gave his life on the cross for us. The only condition is to believe in him and to trust in his obedience, his righteousness, his sacrifice. And unforgiveness is a sin like any other sin. It's not a special sin. It's a sin. The Apostle Paul writes the following about forgiveness in Ephesians 4 verse 32. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Then Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 says this, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So notice here the tone of God, that God has forgiven you first. Then you are called to forgive, but not under the threat of losing your own forgiveness. The things change after the cross, after Jesus died. The passages say that you should forgive. These passages from Ephesians and Colossians say that you should forgive as a natural flow and outcome of what has already been done for you. God forgave you first. As a, natural out, uh, as a natural flow, you should forgive also. But you're not threatened that you lose your own forgiveness if you don't. That's the difference. That's why I believe the parable that talks about unforgiveness is in the Old Testament context. If you are in Christ, you have been forgiven, period, without conditions. Now forgive. After the cross, we are forgiven first. Then we are to forgive, to extend that forgiveness. We no longer forgive to be forgiven, but we forgive because we were forgiven. Do you see the difference? I'll say it again. We no longer forgive to be forgiven, but we forgive because we were already forgiven. And as a believer, you must understand that you are not just forgiven. That's a term that we use, but we are actually justified. We're not just forgiven. When my wife and I quarrel or have a tension or a fight, we bring up things in the past because that's how we are people. And while I may have forgiven her, I have not justified her because I, I brought things from the past. I forgave her, but I have not justified her. God is different and we need to see this difference. He says, I remember your sins no more. He never remembers your sins once he has forgiven them. And that justification. Justification means as if you had never sinned. That's how you are after salvation. You are unblameable. Your nature is unblameable. You cannot be blamed. The Bible says that God does not impute sin on you. Even when you do sinful actions, they are not imputed on you. That's justification. As if you never sinned, you can never sin. That's why the Bible says in John that whoever is born of God does not commit sin. That Because even if you commit some sinful actions, they cannot be imputed to you. You cannot actually sin. You are unblameable. You cannot be blamed. You can never be blamed before God and before the creatures of heaven. And this is a very important theological concept that we need to understand. Jesus did not only forgive you. He did not only provide an aton atonement for your sins, like in the Old Testament. These are old covenant concepts. Forga forgiveness, atonement, they are old covenant concepts. The new covenant concepts are justification. The book of Hebrews said in chapter 10 that he took away your sins. Your sins are remitted, remissions of sin. Once and for all, forgiveness means to overlook the mistakes without doing any payment for them. That's forgiveness. When you forgive someone, you overlook the mistake and you don't expect them to pay for that mistake. That's the meaning of forgiveness, right? Where we were forgiven by God only in the sense that we were not the ones that did the payment for sins. There was a payment, but we didn't do it ourselves. And from that point of view, God forgave us. However, we were actually justified 
way more than forgiven. And we need to understand that I'm saying slowly because it's kind of difficult to grasp. We were justified, which is more than being forgiven because sin was also paid for. Sin was not overlooked by God. Jesus paid for our sins in full. So that's why I'm saying that we were not just forgiven. Although it's, it's not wrong to say that you are forgiven because in a sense you are forgiven because you didn't pay for your sins. But you were justified, which is way more than being forgiven. So that's why that excludes the theme of forgiveness, of unforgiveness from the parable applying to us, the new creations. All your sins and my sins have been taken away, remitted on the cross. They were deleted forever. They will never come back on you if you don't forgive others. That is why before the cross, you must forgive before you are forgiven. But after the cross, you are forgiven first. Then we should forgive. There is no must. We should forgive, but it's not a must. You are not forced. You are not obliged to forgive. It should come as an outcome, as a natural flow out of love, out of thanksgiving, out of gratefulness for what God has done for you already. And Paul says that true forgiveness comes under grace because we know how much we have been forgiven. We realize how much God has forgiven us. Forgiveness under law comes from fear about being punished again. It keeps a record of wrongs and does not come from the heart. That's in the Old Testament. There is no forgetting of sins of the other in the, in the Old Testament. However, when you realize God does not even keep a record of your wrongs, he has chosen to forget your wrongs, you find that forgiveness flows from his grace. And when you come in Christ, you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. Christ is never offended by anyone. So you should never feel offended by anyone or have unforgiveness in your heart because you're no longer living, but Christ lives in you. You are Christ and Christ is in you. And Christ is a forgiving person. And forgiveness is already in our hearts. It's our nature to forgive. We just need to receive the truth and allow that new nature to come from inside out. You are able to forgive even when you think you cannot forgive someone. Know the truth that because you are saved, because you are a born again believer, you have a new spirit, you are capable of forgiving anyone. You just need to look at the word of God and realize how much God has forgiven you. And then it's easy to forgive. You are able to forgive. Reject that lie that you will never be able to forgive someone. Just look at how much God has forgiven you. And then you will see how natural it will be for you to forgive. Amen. So since all our sins have been taken away on the cross once and for all, then also the effects of sin were taken away. What are the effects of sin? Sickness and disease. They were taken away for Christians. Sicknesses were remitted because we are justified. Sickness is illegal in our bodies. We are not to allow sickness to stay in our body. It has no place in us while we are on earth and we are new creations in Christ. So let's, let's close up this, this last obstacle for today that I did it to myself. I gave authority. I have unforgiveness in my heart. That's why I have this sickness. False. Wrong. Receive the truth and receive the joy. You can have faith. You can expel the devil anytime. You can start forgive. Unforgiveness will not be a blockage against your healing in the way of your healing. Amen. And until we see next time, next time we'll continue with other false obstacles. But until we see next time, I pray that God will bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.